Hey, what's up guys? Tookie here, back again with another episode of my new Vegas Golden Knights franchise mode series right here on NHL 19. Now, I want to say first and foremost, thank you very much for the support with the first episode of this series. Glad to see that you guys enjoyed. A couple of things to note, if you're new to my channel, I will say this about the way I handle franchise mode. I try to make a lot of progression, and my videos tend to be very long-winded. They tend to be, you know, marathon episodes, normally over half an hour. If that type of thing, you know, if that type of video isn't your style, hey, it's all good. I understand. And as far as how I handle the modes, at least for the first year, and I think you can kind of tell by how that first episode went, I don't like to make wholesale changes to the roster immediately. I like to take our time. And like I said, with Vegas, they are the perfect team to just keep them, you know, keep the team the same for the first half of the season. Maybe once we get towards the deadline, once we know what this team is, whether or not we're actually going to be good or bad, that's when we can start to look to make those changes. But of course, we had the major curveball of Marc-Andre Fleury being injured. More on that in a second, because the last thing I want to mention before we really dive deep into this episode is that over the past few days, of course, since we've been allowed as, or at least since I've been allowed to uh, upload NHL 19 content, I've made a lot of videos in regards to new content that's in the game. Uh, there was a scouting guide that was uploaded. Of course, I kind of talked about and that uh, talked about the new scouting system in the first episode as well, but I went forward with a whole separate video if you're still confused on that or want some tips and tricks with that. Just the early settings I've been using. Like I mentioned, if I have to do anything very scouting heavy, I'm going to just start cutting that in this episode for the sake of time. Uh, there was also the complete roster overlook, which... Every team in the game, yes, every single team, not just NHL teams, I went through, showcased the overalls, potentials for every single person. Uh, there are timestamps in the comment section of that video, so if you're intrigued to see what certain players are looking like, you have the ability to go check that out. Plenty of other videos as well. Go check those out if you haven't already. And again, thank you for the hype. Thank you for the support. I'm certainly hyped for this series. Let's get into it. As mentioned... In the last episode, Marc-Andre Fleury went down to injury. We are currently having to rely on Malcolm Subban and Oscar Dansk, which is not surprising, seeing as we are the Vegas Golden Knights. However, Malcolm Subban has done fairly well for us so far this season. The wins are, you know, the wins total not great. Very solid save percentage. And Oscar Dansk has been phenomenal. Not exactly getting the wins, but goaltending hasn't been the reason for any struggles we may have had so far this season. But I do want to point out, some people might have already noticed, I changed uh, certain player positions. Uh, so Riley Smith was a right wing, I changed him over to the left wing. The reason for that, of course, is it better sets up the 4-on-4 four -four lines, the 3-on-3 three -three lines, and the power play as well. Someone was asking why I didn't have or didn't put any time into the power play unit. It's pretty much because I knew, and it is, set up exactly how I want it. The only difference is Eric Howla is getting power play time as opposed to Alex Tuck, which is a fair trade. Um, of course, Hala needs to be down here as opposed to Tatar being there. I literally just went best lines before I started recording. Uh, that way, Hala with the morale system, not overly upset about the lack of playing time in the top six. He is a second line forward. So that's the way we're trying to balance it out there. We really want to get Thomas Tatar going, especially with how much Vegas gave up for him in real life. Uh, not the best start to his season, but we're not even at the halfway point yet. So there's a couple of things that we're keeping our eye on with this team. Hopefully, we can stay healthy moving forward. 32 points on the season. We're in third place in our division. Whether or not that stands, we will find out. Uh, we start off the sim with a very, very tough game against a very good LA Kings team. On Twitch, we've been doing a playthrough with the Bruins. The LA Kings won the Stanley Cup in year one. Is the same thing going to happen in this series? That is the question moving forward right now. And go figure, we're able to win the game, but we do lose Braden McNabb to injury. And actually, because of that, uh, it's, pro it's probably going to be Nick Holden that gets into the lineup. But I do want to go best lines just to double check the power play. We're going to take out Carrier yet again. And bring in Nosek, because he's been doing fairly well, actually. Move these guys over, and there we go. That is set up exactly how I wanted it. Defensively, so it's Theodore Schmidt. Eh, eh, 
it's looking okay. We can have we can have Schmidt on that right side. So Holden will be in with Derek Angle, and that bumps up John Merrill a bit. I'm all right with that. Of course, we also have Brad Hunt uh, for defensive depth. Merrill on the power play, I'm not overly excited about, but it is short term, so I think we'll be all right. I don't even know if McNabb is going to miss uh, this entire week. He might be back. He's not going to be back before the Devils game. There was an outside chance. Mark andre Fleury, though, is 100%. That is a big boost for our team moving forward. Although, again, fair play to Oscar Tansk in limited play time. Actually, would he be on waivers if we had to send him down? He would be. I think we're just going to leave him on the roster. We have the ability to just leave him as a healthy scratch. I don't know if he'll be claimed, but I also really don't want to risk losing him. And that opens up the ability for Fukale and Legacy to be the one-two punch with the Chicago Wolves. Whether or not Fukale ever develops, probably not. But, you know, maybe an outside chance. And there's there's the Braden McNabb problem. There it is. Yeah, 21. Okay. Damn, we do have to make a move. Well, Oscar, I hope we don't lose you, buddy. I hope we don't lose you. I mean, high backup at 24. You're not going to get that much better. I'd like to think we're not going to lose him. But I really don't want to lose anybody for free. Would I rather lose uh, Brad Hunt? Potentially. There's no way Brad Hunt doesn't make it through waivers. There's no way. Brad, oh boy. How much time do you have left on your contract? One year. Okay, so at the very least, if Brad Hunt gets pissed off about being sent down, we don't have to worry about it. Indeed, he clears waivers. We'll get him into the lineup down in the AHL. Uh, I just don't want to lose Oscar Dansk. But hopefully that doesn't cause too many problems on the morale front. Uh, we'll go ahead and take out Zach Leslie for Hunt. We'll bring him in and probably just put him on the top pairing with Jason Garrison. Yeah, because we have a ton of lefties as it is, so it doesn't really matter. So Reinhardt with White Cloud. Griffin Reinhardt, by the way, his potential at this point in time. Uh, not good. Not good. Don't expect it to be good. Just reiterating that it's not good, as McNabb is good to go, actually, for this game against Columbus. We lose it 3-2. to two. Curtis McKenzie's back to 100%. I don't recall him missing any playing time, to be honest. The one thing that's surprising, the one thing that's surprising to me, is the fact that we have not lost a game in overtime or a shootout yet. No overtime or shootout losses. McNabb, what's going on, buddy? You are not put back into the lineup. That's what's going on. That's a bad mistake on my part. Uh, yeah, let's go for demanding just to see if that works. That was always the go-to in 18. Okay, at least it has no impact on him. I honestly thought I put him back in the lineup. Can we stop it before the Colorado game? We can. Uh, let's go ahead and fix that. Thankfully, he didn't plummet. Uh, sometimes, at least in NHL 18, if you left a player scratched for one game, that was it. You might as well trade him. Because they're never going to recover. Uh, thankfully, that doesn't appear to be the case here. Eakin back up on the third line. And actually, how's Noshek doing right now? 13 points. How's Carrier done? Hasn't really played much. 5 points in 13 games. I'm going to give Carrier the chance, I think. I'm going to give Carrier the chance. Okay, so here's the thing. Here's the thing as well. Along with changing the position... Of course, changing Riley Smith from right wing to left wing. I also changed player types. Now, look, this is something that some people consider cheating. They're not a fan of it at all. I do end up doing that quite a bit. And mainly it's for the sake of getting a player to play more in line with what their best attributes are. So Riley Smith was a sniper. You can look at that shooting category on the top right. It's good, but it's not great. It makes more sense to run with William Carlson as the sniper of that line. But here's what I've noticed. It doesn't update immediately. I don't know why. For Riley Smith, it finally switched over. That's why I didn't point it out at the start of this episode, because I'm like, oh, okay, it must just must not work. It has changed Smith over. It hasn't changed William Carlson over yet. Obviously, you can look at the stats there. Probably a little bit better to use Smith and to have a little bit of a balance on a line. You know, Smith is the two-way sniper, playmaker. Same thing on the second line. Thomas Tatar, Stashny, Tuck. You can argue with those attributes what the best player type would be. And EA did say this year 
uh, and particularly when it comes to prospects, or in, uh, specifically when it comes to prospects, that players would develop more in line with what their player type was, as opposed to having a sniper who ends up being a better grinder. So it's something that I'm wanting to test, uh, something that I'm wanting to test out here early on, and it is interesting to me that some of the player types changed. Riley Smith changed over, but someone like Carlson did not. And actually, here we need to take a look at that lineup as well. Did I? I did. I forgot to put him back in again. No, I didn't. He's in. Good. I was gonna be like, wait a minute. I, wait a minute, did I really screw that up? Because I saw him complain about ice time, and I'm like, I put you into the lineup. What are you talking about? Turns out it was fine. Uh, and I think we only have healthy scratches on the defensive side. Indeed, we do. I want to make sure that Haig and Braunstrom are in the lineup. Of course, two of our better prospects. Haig right now at a 65. Braunstrom a 64. Their development is going to be crucial moving forward again whether or not they're underrated potential wise Haig, you could argue Braunstrom at least right about where he should be thankfully so I'm good with that hey get a low top four you could argue a medium a low top four though pretty much where he should be I'd say his high end would be a medium top four so thankfully both of those two they're pretty much right on the money with where they should be in terms of their potential so that is quite helpful a lot of other prospects were not as fortunate who do I mean? You could check out the uh, the uh, roster showcase, as I called it. As Riley Smith goes down with a shoulder injury, he's not going to be out for that long. That is going to cause us to have to jump into this. That'll bump Hala up to the top six, which is helpful. Uh, and it puts him on the top line with Carlson and Marchessault. So I think I'll just go forward with that. Let's go Noshek, Aiken, Lindbergh, Carrier, Belmar, Reeves. And defensively, we are fine. I'm good with all that. So we'll see what happens with Riley Smith out of the lineup. Eric Halla into the top six. As we enter January of 2019, we win our first game of the new year against the Kings. Of course, direct competition for us as far as the division title is concerned. 25 and 18. That's it. Again, still no pity points, no overtime losses no shootout losses and I'm concerned because that could really come back to haunt us down the stretch here where a certain team you know fewer wins but because they have those overtime losses they could jump us in the standings let's go ahead and go best lines again here thankfully it is a quick fix to bump these players over that's all we have to do perfect quick and easy thankfully the defense is you know, it's easy to figure out what it is it's what it should be when we go best lines which is nice as opposed to having to put somebody back into the lineup and it just gets all tedious so the injuries haven't been that big of a problem so far we've had some players miss some games obviously the flurry injury didn't help and maybe i should shut my big mouth because it's just injury after injury right now we'll have nick holden replace merrill directly similar players at the very least so we're midway through January, 29 and 20. The Chicago Wolves not doing so hot at all, which doesn't really surprise me uh, given their forward, uh, their lack of forward depth, really. We're in third place in our division. Have there been any trades? I suppose that's the first question on my mind. Not a single trade. The Bruins signed Christopher Stieg, though. They drafted him way back when, so that's somewhat interesting. Uh, let's see where we are. We're seven games. Actually, eight games over the halfway mark. 49 games played on the season. Where are we in the standing? So, again, we're in third, which isn't too bad. I just want to take a look at the race here. As really in this division, I don't know if you can argue that anyone is out of it so far. The Canucks, six points back at Calgary. Still a pretty close race. In the central, you could argue that Colorado's starting to fall out of it a little bit. But they could potentially make it. In the Atlantic... Uh, Buffalo, Florida, definitely struggling. I'm surprised that the Panthers are that bad this season. And in the Metro, the Islanders, the one team that are really falling behind at this point. New Jersey struggling a bit, too. There are quite a few teams. I mean, how five teams right now at at least 50 points. The Metro, of course, is an extremely tough division. So Tampa right now leading the way. Worst team uh, point-wise, the New York Islanders. That Atlantic division struggling yet again thankfully 
uh, we're looking pretty good so far. As far as the scouting is concerned, again, as we get closer to the deadline, we'll take more of a hands-on approach to make sure that fill, you know, to make sure that we fill out the draft board a little bit. We only have three games left this month. There is that break in the schedule where the All-Star game normally would be. And actually, there we go. We do get a central scouting update. Let's take a look as Oscar Bjorkstrand, still ranked number one. Our scouts have him at two. Which is a little bit surprising. As a power forward, 17-year-old power forward in the SHL, only 11 points in 32 games, but again, only 17 years old. Good puck, protect, uh, puck protection, goal scoring, and a pro release, so he has one hell of a shot, which is nice for a power forward, and again, comparable to Owen Nolan, which is great. Tarnkfist, high top four, and that's accurate. I have not seen many high potential players. So that is an interesting one. Stats-wise, he's definitely more of a project comparable to Shea Weber. Hmm. I don't think we'd want to take him in the top five, even if we had the opportunity to. Krebs, Bone, Byram, Kako. We still don't have, have any information on Loxanen. So he's one of the guys that we might have to make sure that we move forward with uh, to actually end up getting that proper information. And as far as gems and busts, Eklund... And a bust in Moritz Cedar. Cider. Cedar Cider. Magnus Eklund, though. 17-year-old, potentially an offensive D-man. Only five games played in the SHL. Good character, skating, looking all right so far. Not locked in, though. We'll keep an eye on him. We'll keep an eye on him. A gem from what I've seen so far early on in this game. Could be a good indication of a solid potential, but a pretty low overall. We're definitely going to need... More information on him if we're going to make that risky of a pick. Gary is up to a 78, by the way, with the way he's playing. So that's solid. And again, 383 overall defenseman. There was the discussion, of course, of what to do with Nate Schmidt. I got to be honest, first episode, I thought maybe I'll sit him out for 20 games. Uh, but let's be honest, that would just be sabotage. And with the way this game works, like I said earlier... When Braden McNabb was pissed about not being back in the lineup, there is an outside chance that I could not get him to recover from the morale crisis that we would put him into. So, don't know if that was necessarily worth it. We pretty much would have been condemning him to being trade bait. Uh, that said, we're into February now. Third in the division on 60 points. And the playoffs are looking likely. It's looking like buying at the deadline might not be the worst move in the world. So when we look at our team here, uh, thankfully for one of the rare occasions this season, we are at 100%. Of course, we do have an extra top two forward. We're not doing terribly, though. Uh, Riley Smith, 32 points is solid. I mean, 32 points in 45 games. It's pretty good. Uh, Carlson as well, not too bad. 39 points in 52 games. Not quite living up to the first line forward tag, but, you know, it is what it is. March or so, uh, again, a similar stat line. So the first line's doing all right. Tatar, 27 points, not bad. Stashny doing well. Alex Tuck also doing well. I'd like that goal-scoring number to be a little bit higher. Hall is killing it on the third line in the power play. Eakin's doing well. Lindbergh's okay. 17 points in 44 games. He's on a pretty good pace. Carrier? Solid. You could argue if he were to play the full season to hit 20 points, and that's pretty much the target. Belmar as well doing all right, and Reeves has eight goals, so I'll take that. I don't necessarily know if we need to bring anybody else onto this team. I mean, obviously, going out and getting a true game changer would be nice, but then the question becomes, well, who the hell sits? Because for the most part, uh, the numbers are going to be looking okay defensively, it's a different story where you could argue, well, maybe having a better defenseman than Derek Englund would be nice. Uh, John Merrill, five points this season, which is fine. Initially, he was a two-way. We changed him to a defensive D, and thankfully that took hold. Changed him to a defensive D due to the deking and hand-eye, uh, and the speed's not great. It is five-star skating. I don't know why, to be honest. Uh, just not someone we want carrying the puck up ice consistently. Uh, but, of course, then we have Colin Miller, we have Nate Schmidt, Shea Theodore, and Braden McNabb as well. So, we're looking all right. We're looking all right. But getting 
a game-changing defenseman. Although then the problem becomes, well, who the hell gets dropped out of that top four, right? If we find a replacement for Engeland and move him into a depth role, who the hell gets dropped? And can we balance that out to have them not get pissed off about being dropped? Goaltending-wise, I mean, we're set up really well. It was just a matter of whether or not we'd underperform or not, but I do like the way that this team looks. However, that can change very, very quickly and over the course of a matter of weeks, which is why if I can hit the right button and stop wasting time, I swear I hit calendar to begin with, though that's extremely weird. Maybe I'm just losing my mind. That's why we're going to sim forward two weeks. Again, the deadline is right here on the 26th, not the 5th. It's on the 26th. Let's go to the 15th. Uh, we'll see what this looks like. And we'll take it from there as the dog is somewhat kind of sort of freaking out. We'll see how we do over this stretch. And if we continue to perform, which I mean we're off to a half decent start, 2-1 and one to begin the month, it might be uh, that much easier to make a decision on what we should do and whether or not we should really go for it. Although, it's certainly looking like that's going to be the right call. This game against Toronto could be huge. Jake Bischoff, so I'm 100%. I didn't even know he was hurt. And we get our first shootout loss of the season. So that moves us to 4-2-1 and one in that stretch. 34-24-1 and one on the season. Where are we in the standings? We're up to second. LA have two games at hand on us and a five-point advantage, so we're unlikely to catch them. It might make sense just to go for it, though, here at this point. Like I said... I would hate to drop like a Thomas Tatar, but imagine in a way a third line of Tatar, Hala, and maybe even Cody Eakin, who hasn't been terrible. He's performing like we kind of needed him to perform closer to Dallas Stars numbers of the past as opposed to 12 points in 60 games. So as a third line guy, he's getting the job done. Uh, now imagine, man, Oscar Lindbergh, though, he's doing pretty well. <laughs> he's doing pretty well. I think that's our big decision is whether or not we just want to disrupt what we're doing here. I do wonder, though, who's on the open market? Who's on the trade block? Who is going to be that much easier to get at a reduced price? So I think at the very least, I'm not guaranteeing to making moves, and we might even have this be a somewhat shorter episode uh, kind of gauging the interest if we get some offers i can set it up and just be like hey well we know this guy's on the block this guy's on the block who do we want to go out and get uh, but that's all hypothetical at the moment i could look around the league at the very least uh, let's set up the block see what offers we get rather than having to go out and look for our own trades let's let's let the people come to us you want our assets then uh yeah you make the offer and of course i'm going to make sure that i get these uh you know at the very least top, some top end offers i would imagine uh, so we're going to completely open up the surplus. We're going to say that every single person on the team is available. Every pick, every player, no problem. As far as the wants go, though, for forwards, I think we're going to set it up to look for anybody 85 overall and up. I'm tempted, I'm tempted to go 83. 85 would be a first line guy. Let's go 83. So any forward, 83 overall and up. And defensively, I'm thinking if we're going to bring anybody in, it's got to be a true top pairing guy. Let's go with the 85 overall here as opposed to the 83. We already have a couple of 83s. So we'll go with the 85 overall there. And we'll see what kind of offers we get. We'll throw in the draft pick eligibility just to see if that sweetens the pot. But... No idea what some of these teams look like right now. Like, what does the Florida Panthers draft block or trade block situation look like? Uh, draft, you know, the draft board as well. Who the hell knows as far as whether or not picks have been made. So let's go ahead and take a look. It's like, what does that team look like right now when they're underperforming to such a crazy extent? Case in point, we've already had some trades. As Tampa, they continue to stock up. They get Gustav Nyquist, a third, and two other assets. From Detroit for Taylor Radish, Mitch Stevens, and a third. So Tampa's going all in. Detroit continuing to do well at the deadline. And Columbus gets Adam Henrique for a first, a second, and Abramoff. 
I, I like Adam Henrique. Don't know if he's worth that much, but okay. Anaheim made out like gangbusters on that deal. Wow. I know it's a second round pick next year, but man, I guess Columbus just really, really likes Adam Henrique. Maybe they had a top center go down. Regardless, that is a very weird situation there. That's a lot to give up for one Adam Henrique. As we will see if we get any offers here. Now, I have had certain teams. And the reason why I'm really intrigued to see this is that previously mentioned Bruins run on Twitch. We set up the trade block in a similar fashion. New Jersey ended up offering me Taylor Hall. We went on to win a Stanley Cup with Taylor Hall. So I am very intrigued. However, nothing has happened yet. And the deadline is two days away. We're going to sim up to deadline day. Will we end up getting an offer? It's not looking like it. Will it come through? It will not. We don't get a single offer, which is fine. Of course, what we were looking for was very specific and somewhat high in price. But it would have been nice to at least get a couple of offers there that we could have at least, uh, you know, pondered accepting but again 73 points now in 63 games 19 games left in this season six points back of the LA Kings tied in points with the San Jose Sharks and five points ahead of the Calgary Flames it is a very very close race and whether or not we make additions here at the deadline again unfortunately deadline day is not a day but if we're gonna do anything we have to do it now Ah, it's a tough call. It's a tough call. Let's let's take a look around the league. Let's take a look at some stats. So goals four per game, something I'm interested in. Are we a top 10 team? Not looking like it. We're okay at a 265. 265 is solid. But, you know, maybe a bit of extra goal scoring wouldn't be too bad. And we were at, what, a 238 for a goals against per game average, which is bottom five in the league. So our defense and our goaltending has been very solid. Uh, Tampa is just lights out. That is phenomenal, uh, as opposed to the New York Islanders, Florida Panthers, and Arizona Coyotes. So we could use that little bit of a boost in terms of scoring. Our power play is at 19.1%, uh, which looks to be about mid-table. Buffalo is somehow at 25. And our penalty kill, if we can get a look here, is at 79. Two, also about mid-table. So special teams, we're nothing, you know, we're, we're not great in either aspect. We're nothing special. Um, it could look to be improved there, and we'll definitely take a look at the lines. It's just the big question of whether or not we want to try and find a top six forward. As we get a look at the point totals here, again, for top-line players, the closer you can be to point a game, the better. Uh, William Carlson on 47 points, I'm all right with that. He and March or so should both finish over 60. That's fine. Holla being on 38. I mean, he's a third-line guy with power play time, so I'm very good with that. Uh, Thomas Tatar, 37 points for a second-liner. If he hits 50, I'll be happy, and he should. Riley Smith, I mean, he's missed a little bit of time, but still he's not quite where we want him to be. Stashney's doing well for a second-liner. Tuck's doing all right for a second-liner. Eakin's doing phenomenally for a third-liner. 30 points is normally the target. 30 is great. 40 is phenomenal. For a third liner, so I'm very happy with him. Uh, Lindbergh as well. Maybe should have been playing all season. He hasn't missed that much time, but he is doing extremely well this season. Uh, and you know, we'll take a look at the defense afterwards. Let's get a full look at the forward. So Reeves, 13 points as a fourth liner. The closer to 20 you get, I'm happy. Uh, he might have an outside chance of getting that. The fact that he might hit 10 goals is insane to me. Uh, Nosek, 13 points in 41 games, is not uh, is not bad, but Carrier has also done quite well. Carrier is on a very similar point pace, actually, uh, whereas Belmar has been a tad bit disappointing. And you know what? The fourth line moving forward might be Carrier, Nosek, and Reeves. Let's see here, 75 face-offs. Yeah, it could be Carrier, Nosek, and Reeves moving forward. Belmar has been very disappointing. This season, only 10 points in 63 games for him. Defensively, Theodore, Miller, and Schmidt, the three you would expect to see at the top, are indeed at the top. A plus 19 for Schmidt this season. From there, it really drops off in terms of point production. Only one of our defensemen, though, 
is a minus. Again, plus minus, not the best stat, but it's one of the few things we have to go off of in this mode. Uh, so it's a good sign at the very least. Speaking of a good sign, Malcolm Subban, still a 926 save percentage through 36 appearances, a 917 for Flurry, and a 940, of course, for Dansk. So it's definitely a question of just whether or not we want to make that addition. I'm kind of happy with the way the team is, but if we want to compete with the LA Kings of the world, we're going to have to take that step up. As you get a look league-wide, Patrick Line, Connor McDavid, Alex Ovechkin, Tyler Sagan, there isn't a single name there where I'm like, man, that's unrealistic. So that's a good sign at the very least. Uh, R&H being up there, perhaps just the McDavid effect you would expect. At least I would. Alex DeBrincat probably on the top line with Kane, more than likely. Uh, Nick Schmaltz, perhaps as well. Tough to say for sure. Goal scoring wise, it's Ovechkin, 39 leading the way. Only a handful of players have over 30 goals this season. So that is ridiculous. And you know what? Power play points. I just want to take a look here. 28 for Patrick Kane. An absolute monster. Face offs one for the hell of it. Ryan Getzlaff's up there. The hit king is Brad Marchand. Don't know if he should be up there in terms of hits. Aggressiveness should be high, but I don't know if he should be the hit leader. And the fight leader is a Jake Dotchin. It is not. It is Ryan Reeves. That's what I like to see. Of course, it was a running joke in NHL 18 that every time it would be Jake Dotchin. Not this time. Uh, among, de of course, that was just for forwards, but I imagine no one hasn't beat. Among defensemen, Eric Carlson leading the way. Burns, Jones, Latang. Again, no real surprising names up there. Maybe some people are like, eh, Shatton, you know, Shattenkirk shouldn't be that high. But for the most part, I agree with that. Uh, and goaltending, I mean, Vasilevsky has to be the best in the league in terms of save percentage. Yes, he is. No surprise there. Rookie-wise, it is Casey Middlestat leading the way. Uh, the Calder is his to lose at this point. 31 points in 62 games. So before we call it an episode, what I'm going to do... It's not a requirement for us to trade for players that are on a team's trade block, but of course it is that much easier to acquire said players. So let's take a look at skaters on the block in Anaheim. They're looking to sell. Silverberg's on an expiring contract, and he's having a pretty rough season. Hasn't played that many games, so it might be injury concerns. And again, we have... Basically, accurate info on him. He he could be he could be a solid rental. Silverberg could be a solid rental. Cogliano's there as well, only 20 points. So I guess just the Ducks in general. Amazing beard on Reeves, by the way. I guess that the Ducks in general are struggling this season. Uh, in terms of forwards, Panic is there. Goligoski uh, being sold by Arizona. Boston just looking to move on prospects. Jeff Skinner already on the block for Buffalo. 43 points. Who's to say that the Sabres wouldn't, uh, wouldn't flip Jeff Skinner? Who's to say? Would Jeff Skinner be the addition that the Vegas Golden Knights need to put them over the top? It could happen. Uh, Carolina's selling, but someone like Justin Williams? Oof. Damn. Justin Williams. Having himself a good season. On an expiring deal. You know, who's who's to say a Justin Williams or even a Furland wouldn't be the worst option in the world? Uh, Artem Anisimov having a decent season, but yeah, three years left. That's not going to happen. Uh, Kunitz actually though, is on an expiring deal, is he not? He's doing all right too. There are definitely some players that we could look to target. Maybe not the caliber of player that we were hoping for previously, I'm not exactly surprised that we didn't get offers before, uh, but there are definitely guys that we could look to target here. Thomas Vanek having an all right season, so weird to see him in a Canucks jersey again. That just that seems like a that seems like a nightmare more than anything. Uh, Zach Cassian there for Edmonton. Hello. Don't know how or when Florida picked up Jordan Eberle, but on an expiring contract, it's not having the best season. But Jordan Everly is available. That is, you have to argue production versus overall on paper. We know the info about Everly is 100% confirmed. 
we have some options here. We have some decisions to make. And of course, you guys, at the very least, will be getting all the info, uh, all the information, all the info on the trade block. So if we decide that, hey, maybe it's worth trading uh, to get an insurance policy over Derek England, uh, you would at least know who's available as well. Ryan Dezingle, having a strong season thus far, could also be worth it on a very cheap and expiring contract. Uh, Philly looking to get rid of uh, mostly prospects and just some extra baggage. San Jose, only prospects there. St. Louis, Thomas Cairo on the market. Damn. Cal Foot also on the market for Tampa with Adam Ernie. Liljegren's being shopped, which is crazy. Vancouver, no one that we'd really want. Washington, no one that we'd really want. And Winnipeg, no one that we'd really want. So needless to say, we have options. From the Jeff Skinners and Jordan Eberleys of the world, Justin Williams, that veteran presence. Uh, but right now, there is that debate. Do we add to this team? Do we try to make sure that we are going to make the playoffs and be in the playoffs in an advantageous position, i.e. not being on the road against San Jose to start things off? Or are we good? Are we content? Stay the course, see how it goes, hopefully make the playoffs. If we do, cool. If we don't, it might not be the worst thing in the world. Let me know what you think. I want your input as far as what we look to do here. In the next episode, we finish up the regular season, and if we make the playoffs, we go through our first round matchup. If we don't, well, then we have a draft to attend to. And of course, now is about the time beyond this date where we'll start taking a little bit more of a hands-on approach with the scouting as well, just to make sure that we get full information on everybody that we can, uh, particularly at the top end of the draft. You never know, of course, players do have the ability to slip if the AI says, no, I like this guy instead, even though he's projected 30th. EA says it can happen. Do I believe them? Why not? Why not? Let's hope for the best. It happens in Madden at the very least. So with that said, thank you very much for watching. Again, I appreciate your support early on with this series and with everything that I've done NHL 19-wise. It is greatly, greatly appreciated. If you enjoyed the video, you know what you can do. Support the video. Support the channel. Support me. I have a cute dog. I can't say the T word. But hey, your support directly leads to her getting T's. And it's great. Although, you know, in fairness, in fairness, she gets, she's gotten a little bit, she gets a little bit chunky in the winter. Just a little bit. And I walk her like three miles a day and she settles out during the summer. So it's fine. It's all good. Don't you, don't you fat shame my dog. She's too cute for that. Anyway, again, thank you for watching. I will see you guys in the next one. Goodbye.